You don't know John. John Weiss is the uh, former director of the Neutral Zone. And do you all know what the Neutral Zone is? A marvelous place in Ann Arbor where kids come from all over when they're, during their teenage years. And it's pretty much run by them. The program is designed by them, uh, purposely set up. And John has been an inspiration in that way. Um, what I didn't know about him was um, that he worked in both Ipsy and Willow Run uh, before that as he started out his career with young people. And he was a teacher, a middle school reform facilitator, and a trainer. Um, and then he was director of the adolescent division of the High Scope Educational Research Foundation. Um, right now, John, I think most recently, has changed his job, and he's no longer the executive director at um, the Neutral Zone. He's now the director of strategic initiatives, which is leading the training and coaching work with other after-school and school-based programs. So a rich environment, a rich heritage for that particular job. That would be wonderful. And um, I just think you have made our county a better place. Because Thank you. You'll make me blush. <laughs> Delighted to have you here. Jeff. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it, and as there's a lot of youth experience in the room, so that's really terrific. Um, my answer to the question is I do have three of my own children between ages 12 and 19, so I have regular contact with them. But <laughs> like Lisa, uh, I have a large catchment of other young people that I work with and support and have the pleasure of just hanging out with at the neutral zone. About 500 teens come over there on a regular basis. So I think. The only person who beats me in the room is Lisa. Um, so um, I like to do training very active, and I like you to bring your own knowledge and experiences to the table. Um, and as obvious by our icebreaker question, you do have a lot of uh, knowledge about young people from your own experiences. So, um, but we are going to uh, focus on adolescents. We're going to focus on a particular area of um, youth work called youth development and for positive youth development and hopefully it'll inform the work that you do as volunteers or in the court systems um, when you work with young people and, and hopefully you'll have a few new insights about where where these young people are in their development. They're in a very special time in their development and we as adults forget about that sometimes. Um, and so I think it's good to be reminded about that, to look a little, a little bit at the research and then to think about how do you want to apply that. So that's what we're going to do today. Okay. And I mentioned to John that in small claims work, which a lot of us do, we often will have like a young person who's a tenant in a landlord tenant case or another, and they're probably a little older than the adolescents. But John said much of what he's talking about also would apply to young people in their young 20s. And adolescence is, is not defined by age, as some of you may know. So, <laughs> And uh, so really, you know, young people that go into their 20s are oftentimes considered older than adolescents. So I was going to get you up and, and, and have you work in a group, but it seems like the room's not real conducive for that. So what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to improvise here. So the people I'm giving this card to do not look at your card until I tell you to do so. You are, car you are person A. Wait, hold on. The adults are worse than the youth. So. <laughs> With your partner, you are partner. Yes, yeah, so yes. I'm going to say, so the partner's on the right, and then I'm going to say it to my partner. Yes, so yes, yeah, yeah, to your partner. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ready? Wait, wait, wait. Partner, <laughs> <laughs> okay, A, hold up your card. A, hold up your card. And B, say the first couple words that come to my suit. Okay, put your cards down. Now, same thing. I don't think I have to explain the whole. But partner B is going to hold it up to A. A, please say a couple words that come to mind when you see this word. Go. Learning. 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 What else? Energetic. Energetic. Yeah. Fun. Fun. Energetic. Cause. Loans. Say again. Loans. Loans. Loan. 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 L-O-A-N-S. Okay. Loans. 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 Loans.
Exciting. Exciting. What else? Creative. Creative. Thank you. Okay, I've run out of room. How about the development side? What did Disabled. you come up with? Say that? Disabled. Disabled. Growth. Growth. What else? Learning. Learning. Maturing. Maturing. Vision. Vision. Empowerment. 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 Evolution. Evolution. Okay. What else? Fundraising. Fundraising. You can that for all. Come on, a couple more. Do I have to make ground rules with this group? The first ground rule is one diva, one mic. One diva, one mic. What does that mean? Thank you. What else? Go ahead, Andy. Fundraising. Fundraising. Oh, not like fundraising. Fundraising. What else? A couple more? I didn't want to scare you by one needle on mic. I just didn't want you to have side conversations. So, what's that? Even though this was developed, it was not mine, can yes. I suggest that? Please do. I mean, we're missing creative. Creative. Okay. So these two words have a lot of meanings, connotations, definitions, but when we put them together, it means something very special in, in the after school work and in a lot of progressive school work. And there's a whole field of research called positive youth development which when again you put these two words together mean something different than when you think about them separately. So what I'd like to do is just give you a quick handout, and I want you to scan this to yourself. I want you to just scan these five or six definitions that took these out of the literature. These are some of the more common definitions uh, about youth development. And I want you to just scan these for about two minutes and pull out some some things that you think are interesting to you or that you hadn't thought about before when you look at these very specific definitions of youth development or positive youth development. So scan that for about two minutes. So what's something that struck you or you hadn't considered before as you read through these definitions of positive development? Not highly organized. In what way would you mean by highly organized? Well, the progression, you know, this is what we do. We, we teach them to become mature. How to work together. Yeah. It's directed by someone else other than the youth. Oftentimes, I mean, it's supported by, by others because you don't have as much experience um, but also, hopefully, they, they, they take some responsibility as well. What else? Um, one of the things that struck me was the, the, the section that says control of one's life. Mm -hmm. Independence and control. And that seems to be the rubber hits the road in yeah. terms of, uh, the, like you say, someone else organizing stuff for them, and they want to be in control, they want to be independent, and they're not ready to exert that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so there's still... That's what the friction is? Yeah, definitely. I saw a hand over here. Okay. And uh, what I uh, sort of summarized in this one sentence, youth development is defined as the ongoing process in which all young people are engaged. It's like no matter what organization or schools or structure is there, they're going to be developing somehow anyway. Yeah. Uh, they may not be invested in it. Hopefully that's right. You can help. I saw a hand just hand it up on that here. Um, I see a trailing pattern of boxes that are, 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 instead of accepting the individual for what the individual is and allowing that creativity, there's boxes of what should be and lots of judgment and lots of voices and superimposing over the individual who may be very different from 
others. So there's a lot of boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have these animal boxes. Is, is it Joanna? Joanna. Joanna. What about Joanna? Okay. What did you want to say? Uh, well, I just wanted to comment on the fact I just went through the Steiner training on teenagers. Okay. And the difference between all the grades. Okay. And I mean high school grades. And what Joanna says especially works in 11th grade. So we were trained just give up. <laughs> you know, let them make their decisions. We are not breaking them at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's very creative. It's co-creative sort of empowerment process. And perhaps so I think that's understood here, but it's not really spelled out. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that word co-creative because I think the best youth development is, is co-creative. Can I see a hand back here? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I was struck by the focus on not focusing on deficits, but on strengths and yeah. potential. Yeah, so positive youth development is really about focusing on the strengths. All right, so now that you know what positive youth development is, um, there's nothing more motivating and exciting than having a pop quiz, right? So you're going to have a pop quiz. So now that you know what youth development is, um, I'm going to give you a quiz. If I run out, you can have a collaborative quiz. <laughs> or you can be collaborative if you want. So this is a list of 13 possible needs that young people have as adolescents. And so I want you to pick the seven. I want you to pick the seven out of this list of 13 that you think are most important for young people's healthy social, emotional, psychological, and cognitive development. So on this list, on this list of 13, which seven do you think are most important? Hold on, are you listening to me still? I am. Okay. Hit the seven that you think are most important for healthy social, emotional, psychological, and cognitive development. Oh, oh, those are the answers. Don't look at those. Oh. Okay. Pencils down, heads up. That's what we say in school, right, Lisa? Okay. So I'm going to share the answers with you. Go ahead and grade yourselves. And uh, throw the correct answers as well. So let me, uh, let me quickly go over these for you um, and just uh, give you a few, a few more insights about them um, and see if you have any questions. So the first one here is physical activity. So young people as adolescents are at a time in their growth where their bodies are growing at any more time, any more time in their lives except when they're infants. So when we have them sit, especially in school, for 15 minutes, they are not meeting their developmental needs. So when you work with young people, if they're getting, as we say in Yiddish, the spilkies, which means uh, jittery, that means because they, they demand physical activity, their bodies demand that for growth. So the fact that young people want to get up and move around and engage physically is one of their developmental needs. Um, structure and clear limits. Um, oftentimes when I work with youth workers, they won't select this one. And young people, as they struggle for independence, as they struggle you know, to create their identities, they still need structure and clear limits, but they do need authentic choices within those structures and clear limits. So at the neutral zone, we have some very, you know, very base rules. There's obviously no drugs, no alcohol. It's a substance-free space. Um, but we do allow a lot of creative expression and some of it gets pretty racy 
Um, but we feel like that's okay for young people. But we obviously have these other sets of rules about their physical and emotional safety that we that we set as limits. But, but within that, they still have a lot of opportunity for choices. Creative expression, I appreciate a couple people mentioned that. Um, young people need verbal, nonverbal opportunities to explore who they are, to express themselves. Um, and again, as schools take away um, the arts, we're, we're taking away a developmental need that young people have for healthy growth. Um, Self-definition, young people are defining who they are in this world. It's that time of life where you're, you're trying to decide who you are, what group you belong to, where you fit in. And so the fact that they sometimes act out or have some wild expressions of their identities is, is, meets their developmental need for self-definition. Um, young people don't, oftentimes don't feel confident. Um, they're unsure of themselves. And the more opportunities they have to um, demonstrate that they are confident and they can achieve helps to support their healthy growth and development. Uh, meaningful participation. Um, I know that many of you know about the neutral zone and the work we do. We're really trying to give young people meaningful roles, not only in their programs, but in the organization itself. Um, 13 out of our 28 board members are teens. So they participate at the highest levels of governance at the neutral zone. So they have a meaningful stake in what we do. And then finally, positive social interactions, both with peers and adults. Um, it's, it's always heartening to me when I bring adults to the neutral zone on a mission tour, the teens love connecting with adults. Whether you're a banker, a lawyer, a judge, a business person, I mean, they, they love connecting with adults as long as it's not their parents. Right? <laughs> and so these, these positive social interactions are important for their development, both with their peers and with adults outside of their family structure. Do you have any um, questions or reactions to these seven development needs? Um, if I may, John, mm -hmm. for the first one, the reason we didn't choose number one is because we thought about students who may have some challenges in terms of being in wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the reason that we didn't say that, but we, of course, certainly saw the need for the physical activity. Sure. And with regards to, I'm sorry, because I can't see that far, so I have to look on the paper. Yeah. The need for creative expression and the need for self-definition. We chose creative expression, but I think we collectively thought that the need for self-definition would kind of fall into that category. It oftentimes does. Okay. One of the things, at least, that we do in the neutral zone to help support the self-definition is we do run some programs that focus on specific identities. Okay. We have a young women's program. We have a diversity dialogue program. We have a program for LGBTQ youth. And so for, they don't necessarily do creative kinds of things, but they engage in dialogue to help explore self-definition. Thank so you. sometimes dialogue. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. You know, words not, tend to have a toxicity to themselves. I'm sorry, I, say that again. Words tend to have yeah. a toxicity unto themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think I agree with you about structure and clear limits, but I think we need to change those words because uh, structure and clear limits have been very um, um, constraining. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe different, two different words that are sort of similar but not that have been repeated and drummed into people for so long is a better alternative. Yeah, I, I, I just pulled this from the literature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the physical activity, I taught in an independent school, which was ranked as the second best high school in the entire state of Michigan. Okay. But they took away recess. Well, they have recess, but they weren't allowed to go outside and quote, play. Yeah. And that apparently is because there are so many lawsuits in our society now that people are worried about somebody's kid hurting someone else's kid. And I remember one day being very sad, it snowed, and the kids went out to play in the snow, and the next day we teachers all got a note saying we mustn't let the kids out in the snow. Mm -hmm. And I think our society is harming our children by fussing over the things that we did as children and enjoyed. Yeah. And I there's a lot of research about that. How recess is an important part yeah. of the school day. Um, so and schools need to be aware of that. I don't know what public high schools do. Mine was an independent school where they they feel more quote answerable to the parents. But yeah, I think it's less on a public schools from my experience. So anyway, um, I believe physical activity is important, as everybody said. 
But since I had a uh, class of high school seniors last year, I couldn't get them off the chairs. They were total couch potatoes. <laughs> and not only that, they complained about their um, Eurythmy class, which they had earlier in the day. I mean, they just hated it. I mean, they hated every physical activity. So it does not apply to high school seniors from my experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's the exception to the rule. <laughs> and then the second thing, I totally feel like Angie about structure and clear limits. Having been a permissive parent, grandparent, and you know, I, I'm really worried about those two words. Again, I, I pulled it from the research, but what I'll say, and I, I mean, too, I'm, I'm a permissive youth worker, um, but for young people's healthy development, they really, um, they really um, depend on limits to help them through a healthy development. And again, it's, you know, the limits should be realistic and they should have lots of choice within that. But they, it really helps their healthy de development to de depend on some limits. So again, my example, the neutral zone, we would never let them bring substances into the neutral zone. That's just inappropriate and illegal. But um, you know, besides that, pretty much anything that's legal, you know, we try to support. Yeah. I just wondered if the word expectations can bind us a possible alternative to limits. Yeah. We have to ask scales and Newman who right. did the research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so I read that in the because I was wondering about it, but I read it in the context of the next one, which says clear rules set by adult staff to punish negative behavior. Right. So I thought that was the downside. The positive side was the limits that we all set just by how we interact and what, what the expectations are, whether they're articulated or not, there still are known limits that kids can perceive. Yeah. Let me take one more comment and then we'll move on. I'm just struck by the fact that these things, I think, apply to all child development, mm -hmm. not just adolescent mm -hmm. child development. I'm thinking of the uh, note in the front of my um, kindergarten grandchild's class. And it says something like respect, responsibility, care for ourselves and others. I don't see that it's all very different as you proceed through adolescence. I mean, I think it starts, well, these things all start with very young children before they even begin to be in groups. Yeah, the next thing that we're going to do, though, we're going to specifically focus on adolescent cognitive, social, and psychosocial development. And so we do also really have to recognize that young people do reach different stages in their development. You, and we, I don't want to say by age, because some young people develop slower and some develop faster. But the more we recognize that as people that we interact, as people that interact with young people, the better are we are able to support them. So I would agree that in some respects, many of these principles apply. But they apply in a very different way to an elementary age young person than they do to a high school or 20-something. So I just want you to keep that in mind because cognitively young people are in a different place. They're, um, you know, when a young person is still in formal operations, they're sometimes not even to imagine themselves in a different identity or what they might become. So to expect a younger person to do a lot around self-definition is <coughs> where they are cognitively. So we do have to keep that in mind. On that issue, um, I think it's the peer issue is the huge piece because I know kids that are homeschooled have a very different system in place about where they need to be and pressures and that stuff than other kids who are influenced and whether they have siblings because um, many youth right now that are 13 to 17, if we went back 25 years, their thought patterns would be more like 8 to, to, to 11 because of the social technology. Yeah, yeah, there are definitely lots of influencers, and in fact, one of the people that we're going to study now talks a lot about how culture influences development. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually divide into three groups, and each group is going to become an expert group on what I call one of three guys. You've heard of five guys in the restaurant? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in youth development or in educational psychology, there's only three guys. 
uh, with Piaget, Vygotsky, and Erickson. And they all studied different um, parts of young people's development and kind of put them into stages uh, around their development. And I think their, their theoretical basis helps to provide some really interesting um, information for us that work with young people in terms of thinking about where they're at and how to best support them. So we're going to divide into three small groups. Each group is going to have a reading about one of the three guys. And what I'm going to ask you to do, um, well, um, in your group, I'm going to give you a large piece of social paper, and you're going to divide it into two. And I want you to put three to five key ideas about your reading on this side. And on the other side, three to four strategies that you might use as volunteers or that you would think about based on this particular section you're reading on research that would help support the youth or the young people that you work with in your volunteer setting as uh, mediators. Does that make sense? So you're going to read, you're going to discuss, you're going to list three to five key points from your reading, and three or four strategies that you could think of that apply to that particular reading or that particular theoretical framework that would be um, useful for you as mediators or as volunteers. I wondered if you could uh, articulate the sort of problem that we're solving here. I have the sense that we're not just talking about letting a kid grow up. We're talking about dealing with something that's a difficulty. Well, when Sally asked me to come uh, work with you, what she said is that a lot of the, the um, folks that you work with as mediators are in that maybe late teenage to early 20 range. And she said that it might be helpful to have some kind of insights into where those young people are at in their development or in their lives so that you could better support them as mediators. So I think that's the problem we're trying to solve. Does that answer your question? That sounds good. I'm, I'm fairly new here, so okay. I think that's good. Did I, did I say that right, Sally? Or yes, it? close to it. That, that I have noticed that sometimes when we do deal with young people, that they are discriminated against. And we spend a lot of time talking about racial discrimination, other kinds of discrimination, and even discrimination of the elderly. But we hadn't talked about discrimination against youth and how our mindset just might be, this person is irresponsible as we think about the young person. And so we want to do a little shift in that so that we have more respect. So we're going to be in groups of nine. So why don't we just cluster you where you're at? Maybe you can kind of, you know, make a small group. So we have three, six. So I'm going to have a little bit of a review of our three guys. And I'll, I'll just let me say two things about this exercise. One is I heard I heard some really um, good dialogue and also some disagreement with what you were reading or that maybe wasn't up to date. And I think that's that's fine. Um, these three um, educational psychologists are still studied in schools of education, but there's lots of current research taking these frameworks to a more modern place. But I think some of the foundational principles are still really important in education and youth work, and that's why I have you read it. The other thing, too, is, and I don't know if this caused some discomfort, and if it did, that's good, because we learn when we get into a state of disequilibrium, and then we can reach new, higher orders of learning. But instead of me telling you what it is you should know, I wanted you to construct your own knowledge from it. And what you put down on your paper and what you discussed probably would be a little bit different, or maybe even a lot different than what I would have told you what you needed to know from this. So I'm a real believer in constructing your own knowledge based on what you read and your own experiences. So that's why I had you get in small groups and do some scribing. So um, just to wrap up, I want to do two things. I want to let each group have a really brief presentation uh, about what they read and maybe a couple of key strategies that they thought about. And then maybe to wind up, um, I'll give everybody a note card, and I just want you to have a takeaway from today. So as you're thinking and as you're uh, hearing your peers present and thinking about some of the things we discussed earlier, I want you to keep this question in mind that teens or young adults are blank. 
So as a volunteer or as a mediator, I should blame. So I want you to think of a couple takeaways, especially thinking about where youth are, adolescence, adolescent development, youth development. What, what's your takeaway? So um, let quick me question, send. Quick, quick. Yeah. Are we allowed to keep these? Yes, you are. All right. I'm not, we're not collecting your grading. Okay. Unless Sally wants me to. So um, I'm going to give you a blank note card, and maybe you could maybe you could come up with two ideas, one on one side, one on the other. So um, how about our PSA group? Is there some volunteer who'd be willing to summarize what you put down or what you discussed, and particularly focusing on what you think some of the strategies are coming out of that framework? Our key points, number one, first of all, we have to recognize the fact that there are four stages of development, and uh, number two, that they progress at different rates. Number three, the adolescence is, is generally accepted to be at the fourth stage, the other three were pre-adolescent. Uh, and four, learning to learn, uh, you, you're learning to learn, not just to memorize, was what we took away as key points in that. Sir, before we move on to the strategy, okay. does anybody want to elaborate on any of the key points? I think the one thing that I'll add is uh, this, this third point, adolescence is the fourth stage. PJ calls that formal operations. So what he says is that young people at this stage are able to think in the abstract. And that's really a key to adolescence, is you're not rooted in what are called concrete operations, where your thoughts are based on what you experience directly experienced, but you're able to think in the abstract, you're able to theorize. But the other interesting thing that I always pull out of that reading is there's some research that only 50% of adults have reached formal operations. And so as I think about your work and you think about mediating and working with people who are on the younger side, maybe they haven't fully reached formal operations. So if you ask them a question and ask them to think in the abstract, cognitively they may not be able to do that. And so hopefully you wouldn't be frustrated or the judge or whoever you know is part of the mediation is frustrated, but to understand that that's where that person is in their development. And that's that's real. So that's something I think about when I read this section on PJ. You want to tell us a little bit about some of the strategies you thought matched up with Piaget's ideas? Um, the first two more or less are just discussing the article itself. And that was acceptance of the fact that there are stages, four stages, and that learning is ex ex uh, experimental learning might be a way to help them get through from the first three to the adolescent one. Uh, the next couple were more or less um, zeroing in on what the mediator could do, and that was be empathetic to the age group that you're dealing with. Um, try to provide appropriate learning environment for, for the stage that you're, you're working with, or particularly adolescent. Avoid predetermination and biases on our part about how smart or not smart teenagers are, you know, based on the teenagers that we have dealt with. And six, don't generalize and stereotype. And four, uh, use constructive criticism, not negativity in dealing with. Neutrals all we give snaps for me. Give <laughs> some snaps for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of time. Is there one or two questions or reactions to PJ? Okay, let's go back to Erickson. Who wants to tell us about Erickson's stages of psychosocial development? Who are the Erickson experts in the crowd? <laughs> <laughs> well, one reaction I got, it's full of bus. Yeah. If you don't do it, if you don't pass this stage, you're screwed up. Wow. You can't go on to the next stage. If you're not potty trained, or you didn't have a positive experience to be potty trained, you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the extreme interpretation, but that's the yeah, way that Actually, I think uh, the ones we wrote down were pretty much 
subsumed in what you're saying, that they're necessary psychosocial stages to navigate successfully. And the two that are particularly relevant in adolescence are industry versus inferiority and identity versus role confusion. And the failure to resolve an issue at a particular stage could resolve in problems at a later stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the two stages that apply to adolescents or young adults is inferiority versus um, uh, industry. So young people are trying to be industrious, they're trying to you know, be competent. And then identity versus role confusion, they're really trying to you know, make an identity for themselves, especially outside of the family and the larger community. And if they, if they aren't able to do that, they may have role confusion or what Erickson calls role confusion. So how does, that, how does this whole notion of young people trying to uh, formulate their identities, how does, why, why does it matter to your work as mediators? Well, empowerment is the word to explain. They don't have a clear idea of what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And we are there to help them have a voice, I think, is our job. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that does more for them than a lot of people have done for them their entire life up to that point. Probably so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think sometimes younger clients um, present themselves with attitude that may not represent their truer self, and they're putting on a facade because they're in a grown-up place, and there's lots of things that are playing out. And I think it's really important that we look beyond the facade and um, the courageous outward appearance they might have um, to someone who's still developing and still trying out identities. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that's really important to keep in mind. I think when they come into mediation, those people feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. This is not a friendly, warm, loving, trusting place. Yeah. And I'm going to be judged. Yeah. And so how do you overcome that, even though that was something that they should have learned how to deal with? Early goodbye you must do. Mm -hmm. So establishing a, a trust, supporting environment mm -hmm. is very, very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Is that really true? Because even in the juvenile peace circles, the youth have a voice, but ultimately doesn't have the power because there's still decisions that are made by others. And so when you're in the circle, and the circle consists of less than your peers because there usually isn't like another younger person, um, but, you know, that voice sort of gets diluted somewhat. I mean, it's a voice, but not necessarily a real voice. Um, There's a hand back there. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I saw your hand. That's your hand. Go ahead. I, one thing that struck me is having um, a case last year in which a parent was invited to come in, and we often do that if there's a um, a minor, right? I, I don't remember what the definition was, but we can invite the accompanying adult to come in if it's okay with the minor. And the dynamic changed dramatically. It was very important to remember that the client was not the parent, mm -hmm. but the minor, mm -hmm. and to give them the, the responsibility and respect due to them to present the situation rather than allow them to defer to the parent. And that's probably a, you know, a strategy you have to uh, think, think about nice. and implement as a mediator to make sure that their voice is heard. Right, they can't own the decision yep. that they come to with the other party if they are not the ones participating. Yep. Um, so let me let the Vygotsky group share a few ideas that you want to share with the larger group about what we read and discussed. I'm talking about that. I am talking about that. So I did the writing and someone else did the talking. <laughs> <laughs> I took the picture. Well, just to take off from what we were just talking about, because he has a main uh, point about peer interaction and how that, um, how learning takes place with peer interaction. So we talked a lot about how facilitators um, of mediation really must figure out how to get the um, youth, young adult, 
to um, express their real position or concern. Mm -hmm. And that the mediation itself, the structure of it, is um, another of his points is something called guided participation. So, and scaffolding, which is the structure of the mediation helps to facilitate that if the facilitator is alert to whether the youth is not expressing themselves, whether they're quiet, you have to figure out how to get them to talk. And, you know, Craig, I was thinking, you were talking about the internal dialogue, which is one of the points you were making. Um, sometimes I've seen um, caucusing work. In fact, it was just last week I saw caucusing work where I thought we weren't going to get to a, um, an agreement, but when the other person went out and had to sit there by himself for a while while we caucused with one of them and then, you know, yeah. changed it around, uh, suddenly in that time of internal discussion mm -hmm. uh, on the parts of the, of the two parties, they uh, came back in with different offers, so to speak. Yeah, so maybe one of the strategies is giving people the space mm -hmm. to have that internal dialogue. And I was thinking something similar that sometimes maybe if you ask a young person a question, they don't respond right away. They may be having that internal mm -hmm. dialogue, so really letting them have the space. They're not being obstinate. They're just processing, mm -hmm. and that's part of their normal development. So um, we just have a few minutes. I gave you a note card. I asked you to um, maybe jot down one or two ideas about things you're taking away. Um, so I'll just throw it out to the large group if there are a few people who want to share as we wrap up. What are you taking away from what we read and discussed um, and thought about um, youth development, positive youth development, and again, what I affectionately call the three guys. And anybody who wants to share can do so. As I tread lightly, this is extremely complex. And we haven't even thrown the cultural differences in on this. This is pretty much, I think, a Western look. Yeah. We are not getting pure Western cultures coming into consideration. So um, we would bring a very whole lot. and adults um, had extraordinary potential, so I should be sure not to quash that. Yeah, yeah sort of, that's half of what I was going to say. Just so recognizing the need to balance viewing the person as having competence and abilities and creativity, but also needing to be, I don't know, well, recognizing that they don't have all the answers necessarily, they they're need, probably need to learn some things, and so help with that while recognizing their the abilities they do have. Yeah. Yeah. I think the insanity of trying young know, people as adults mm -hmm. crimes. Yes. Because developmentally they may really need help with that. Teens of men, young adults are still becoming who they are, and I should be flexible and supportive. Yeah. We all appreciate that. So I'm just trying to think this through, but it seems like we're talking about, um, well, in the many situations, we're going to have someone who's got a more dominant personality and position and one who's reticent or not as sure of himself. And, and the teen is really like that. Less that, that um, person who might be fearful or quiet or uncertain. It's not that they're necessarily in a totally different space, but it's a variation on something we see all the time where we're trying to level.
have some recommendations for people who are writing today about um, adolescent development that might be helpful for sure, us? Yeah. Because what struck me was, I, I mean, some of us have probably read Erickson 30, 40 years ago, and I thought it was pretty cool then, and I didn't at all today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, no, I can yeah. forward some things. And, yeah, I'd love to have um, some other people to read and maybe some women who have done some thinking about this. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with your three guys, yeah, no, that's but there are other perspectives and maybe some more information has evolved in the last 50 years. Sure. Well, because part of the current information of, of the last five years is based on brain development, which we could only see now, we've never been able to see it, and that's what the teenage brain, you know, deals with. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of this, the things we have read are sort of, you know, where things pra read and practiced by generations, but the current stuff sort of, you know, um, overrides it, I would say. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick up a few things and I'll send it to Sam. Selling the Thank you very much. And Tom, I appreciate your comment too about it being a Western view. Um, the work that we do training others, we do a lot of cultural competence work because we are, um, that's part of our values. Um, so um, if you want somebody from Neutral Zone to come do cultural competence around young people, that would be cool. I think it would feel a little awesome. A couple more things you get a chance to No, I was just responding to the woman just in, in terms of, of women in the field. I would go to Carol Gilligan for the psychological stuff and Deborah Tannen for the language stuff. That was just Thank you. my things. But even Carol Gilligan's 20 years old. Oh, right, it's old. Yeah. I studied with her 20 years yeah. ago. I know. So when I see neutral zone, I always think that it's LGBT tolerant. Is that what it means? So that's another aspect of culture. Um, teens came up with the name neutral zone because they wanted it to be a neutral space where young people from all over the county, no matter what their identity or school affiliation, could come and you know feel safe. I think that was really the basis. And it started a long time ago. A while ago. Uh, 1998. Right. And there's always been a very large LGBTQ program. Um, so that's definitely a big part of who we are, but it isn't the only part. We had some speakers from Neutral Zone come out for the Bar Association. And what I thought was very, um, one thing I learned was the fluidity of um, you know, how they work. They try to move away from labels. And, and, and from um, things that should or should be and, and, and get you thinking. And that's why I think that if we take anything out of today, it's about emulating about those types of things that, that these kids came up with. Well, I know it's after 1 o'clock. Okay. Thank you so much.